Open Live, a new series presented by Academy of Americans, which features two poets with new or forthcoming books every other Friday, beginning today through October 30th. To see the full lineup for Books Noted Live and our fall winter season of events, please visit poets.org. My name is Nikai Paredes, and I'm the Senior Programs Manager at the Academy of American Poets. For those of you who don't know us, we're the nation's leading champion of poets, poetry, and poetry organizations. We produce Poets.org, National Poetry Month, which is celebrated every April, and the popular Poem a Day series, among many other free programs and online resources. Our programs are made possible in part by the New York State Council for the Arts and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. Our virtual events this season are kept free thanks to generous, generous contributions by you, our audience members. If you're able to make a contribution, please click on the button below to donate now. Before I introduce the two poets who will be reading and in conversation this evening, I would like to acknowledge that I am joining this virtual event from Queens, New York, which is the traditional lands of the Monsi Lenape and Kinarsi people who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. I would also like to provide a description of my video feed for those in our audience with visual disabilities. I am a brown woman with a Filipino descent in her early 30s with long black hair, wearing a black blouse, a red necklace and earphones. I am seated and behind me are two small plants and a poster that says National Poetry Month. Finally, I would love to remind everyone to be respectful of your fellow audience members and of our guest poets in the chat. Thanks so much for your cooperation. Tonight, I'm thrilled and so, so honored to introduce Tyree Day and Honoré Fanon Jeffers. Tyree Day was raised in Youngsville, North Carolina. He is the author of River Hymns from American Poetry Review, which received the APR Honickman First Book Prize. His newest collection, Cardinal, is now available from Copper Canyon Press. A Cave Canem Fellow and a Palm Beach Poetry Festival Langston Hughes Fellow, Day is the recipient of a Whiting Writers Award and a finalist for the Kate Tufts Award. He was the 2019 Diana and Simon Rabb writer in residence at University of California, Santa Barbara, and is a teaching assistant professor at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Our second reader is Honoré Fanon Jeffers. She received an MFA from the University of Alabama. Jeffers is the author of five poetry collections, including The Age of Phyllis Poems, which was published recently by Wesleyan University Press and long listed for the 2020 National Book Award for Poetry. She is also the author of The Gospel of Barbecue from Kent State University Press, which was selected by Lucille Clifton for the Stan and Tom Wick Poetry Prize. Jeffers has been a resident at the McDowell Colony and has won, a won awards from the Rona Jaff Jaffe Foundation for Women Writers and the Barbara Denning Memorial Fund for Women. In 2011, she received a fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts. She won the Harper Lee Award for Alabama's Distinguished Writer of the Year in 2018. She is currently a professor of English at the University of Oklahoma and lives in Norman, Oklahoma. Tyree and Honoré, the floor is yours. All right, um, thank you all again. I'm just gonna dive right in. By land. I've lived on dirt roads that bent and ended at a gate of ponds. The dust skipped up. Did it make my mother look like a dream? I've lived on roads that drag through America. I've paced only them to the next town. The road we kissed on is gone, rich folks buying up all the city in which we make do. I miss when Sonny could do a willy all the way down Person Street and no one would call the police 
because he was a part of the neighborhood, like the honeysuckle bush between two yards, and he was beautiful, not like a horse standing alone in a yellow field, but like a man is beautiful. Most of the little towns have a road nicknamed Devil's Turn, where someone's brother died on a Saturday night while Nina sang, tell me more and more, and then some on the caddies radio, the moon, the color of the Otis Cardinal. Every road isn't a way out. Some circle back like wolves. You can't get lost on them and they won't lose you. Others wait for you to run out of gas, then come alive with what your mother said would take you. Every road promises something like a father does, but when you arrive, the town is empty and you wait like a child questioning everything, the road itself laughing like a drunk man falling into a roadside ditch. The road I'm walking now is howling and full of moon. Hopefully it will lead to myself. Hopefully they'll take me home. I want it to place an ocean. I tell my uncle's ghost, don't waste your time hunting white folks who owe you money. I try to give him my body, but he won't take it and pulls his wagon on. I began in fields near ponds where we laughed and fried fish. If someone were to sing, it would grow through each ghost and be heard as geese crossing overhead. The dead know the work they have done. And if they are not careful, their hands will stay in the shape of that work. My hands haven't touched cotton or tobacco. I haven't pulled small green worms or carried them inside with me, hidden in the body's doublings. I was only a child in harvested fields. When my people let the cotton sleep, there were no vacations. The fields of Roseville belong to my kinfolk, dead and alive. And I don't know if my great grandparents ever saw the ocean or fell asleep on the beach. The Mechanical Cotton Picker for Black Chicago Poets. It wasn't that they killed John Boy in front of his mama's small blue house and that no one called her Miss Bluebird anymore. Out of respect, though she never minded the name, it made her believe she'd fly off someday. Or that a sheriff let John Boy's body sit until even the baby stopped crying, their eyes filled with him, his body already going to marble no one would be able to lift from their sleeps. It was that we could feed ourselves then by getting down on our hands and knees to pick cotton and most knew what a body smelled like blowing down a dirt road. When Chicago reached my ear, the war was full of bodies. They sent whole train cars for us black folk. I read The Defender and waited to hide my face behind the curtains of a northbound train, and I prayed the train car would fly. The South truly don't want us to go. A Mississippi cop would catch a family disappearing behind a rainstorm and send them home, the clouds leaving four muddy fields at a time. I left like a season's first lover across a window, slowly like a southern sun diagonal on a work back. I wanted to carry my aunts to Chicago with me, like this obituary filled Bible, these plums I got saved, purpling in my bag. Miss Mary Mack introduces her wings. My name is Miss Mary Mack, Mack, Mack. You sing it, my name. I turned into a bluebird last summer. I flew through all the South, my wings are blue, and I touched the sky. At first, I decided I was never coming back. 
I took off my black house dress. I knew freedom was not the act of flying, but the steady beat of wings. It was my steady black, blue, and my blues were gone. I wanted to be a bird and became. Leave yourself all over for Grandmother Carrie. Teach me to love the way only the dead know. Sometimes I want to see you so badly, I dream myself full of the reddest wings. I do the things I promised my mother I'd never do again. You wouldn't recognize me now or the town. Three highways run through old tobacco land. I weep all night for you, will not stop no matter the bright purple festivals, the fireworks that scare everything from the sky. On my way to visit your grave, where you're buried beside your lonesome son, who walked Youngsville all day like an angel no one would give proper wings. I wanted to see you in that small town where our last name watered a crop of sorbings, labored under a white man's promise. I wanted to see you in that wide graveyard as a cardinal. When I arrived, I wanted there to be Jubilee, chalk red feathers dotting the sky like a little blood moon. I think I'll never be through with the dead, my altar full of whole other worlds. And, we, and when you no longer ghost among your children, grandchildren, when you become fully angel, a bird I let loose in my house, will you still remember us and our jerry-rigged lives? I know it's hard work being dead. Carry me. I follow the shimmer far down a road I still haven't found the ending to. I picked up my life. My mother sewn a map to the back of. So one day I, la I lay it out and travel back to the flat land of Eastern North Carolina, a map to land where my body will die, where my ghost won't ride the trains all night, count steps from liberty to home. I tried to find the ocean before I was covered in Southern soil. I put my head underneath the Atlantic, swallowed so many memories. I'm filled with people. Someone has taught me to fly. Whichever way I flew, my inheritance couldn't be lifted from northeastern North Carolina's wet clay, its hands hardened around my already weighted ankles. My mother's mother planted hydrangeas where I wanted to place an ocean, where I wanted to place an ocean, she grew me. I picked up my life, for it was the only one I had to pick up. How the body must pick itself up if no one is around to offer a rounded hand out of the snow that only buries. Stuck to my life were the same things I carry back with me now. My father's lying I've mastered and wear the way a field wears the bones of birds. The grand tent gin bottles my uncles made of their bare nights. My mother, the only reason I have something to pick up. And the last poem. Thank you all again. From which I flew. Only together holding their hands in silence can I see what a field has done to my mother, aunts, and uncles. The land around my grandmother's old tin roof has changed. I doubt she recognized it from above. How many blackbirds does it take to lift a house? I'll bring my living, you wake your dead. We have nowhere to go, but we're leaving anyhow by many ways. When they ask why you want to fly blackbird, say, I want to leave the South because it killed the first man I loved and so much more killing. Say my son's name. His death was the first thing to break me in and fly me through town. If grief has a body, it wears his Dodgers cap 
and still walks to the corner store to buy lottery tickets and Budweiser 40s. I don't like what I have to be here to be. All the black birds with nowhere to go keep leaving. Thank you. Hello. All right, you can hear me. All right. Um, hello, my name is Lana Rae and Jeffers. First, I'd like to say that I am living on um, land that is traditional Kickapoo, Osage, and Wichita. And as a result of um, a recent United States Supreme Court decision, I am honored to now be living on a Native American reservation in Oklahoma. Um, for the audience, um, I am a milk chocolate uh, African-American woman. I am wearing uh, cat eye glasses. Behind me is a thrift shop bookcase filled with um, many books and a poster um, of the cover of my first um, book. Uh, and it is a piece of artwork by Camille Billups, God rest her soul, who allowed me to use the artwork for free. Um, this has been a very difficult uh, week, a very difficult year. And so um, first we have lost um, Supreme Court Justice uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. We have lost the great black intellectual Stanley Crouch. And then this week we have been grieving um, our dear sister Breonna Taylor. So I am just going to read four points uh, about uh, black love, community and spirituality. The first two are from the age of Phyllis. The second is from my second book, Outlandish Blues, and the third was published on the Academy of American Poets website. Isabel, Virginia Colony, circa 1621. Like any love should be, hers was touch and never leave. Some arguments and tears with Antony, her husband, but no freedom. They were tied, a curt blessing in that era of dark skin and kin. Separations would occur soon enough, but they had to band together this woman and her man who might have come on a ship with 18 others. Isabel cooked for him from flesh he trapped or caught. They might have looked at the entrails of his prey to decipher what the day had been back home in Africa. What would the drums say? Was it a feast time? Was their village in the same spot? When their son was born, Isabel probably kept him away from others for several days. That night when the necessary seclusion was done, Antony would have shaved the baby's head and spat in his ear, tapped a foot on the floor, told an unforgotten story. And then Isabel put the baby to her breast and sang, your name is William here, but mother calls you something else, something old in secret. This next point is about the courtship of Phyllis Wheatley before she became Phyllis Wheatley Peters and John Peters. Free Negro courtship number two. Phyllis Wheatley and John Peters, Boston circa winter 1775. Black John's slowing down his feet on cobblestones, waiting, listening for nosy gawkers. No, there was safety. 
his sneaking to the side alley off Queen Street. And there she was, his black Phyllis. I'm unafraid of watered memories. But this is a poem in which tragedy can't be invoked as when a black mama reminds you, you know God don't like ugly. The first time, a careful kiss between two sets of black lips breathing together. The next time when black separation grew unthinkable, days and weeks and Months until John spoke his wish after the death of Susanna, the Wheatley's house was no longer home for Phyllis. Maybe if he did things right, she might link her black life with his, his desire to protect her from ships stepped between his black woman and sailors. His vow that sang over water to where her black parents might hear. He didn't just desire their black daughter. He was honorable. He intended. It's not hard for me to conjure this, to have no black shame and their black joy. These black people, these free Negroes are my own and they had love. They still do. I'm still here. The Book of Alabama, Chapter Coltrane from Michael S. Harper. I've been plagued by spirits. Visitations of uh, visitations of death, fire feeding off sheeted breath. Sometimes I see the bones of God's back turn to me. Hands stroke the lynch knot, bear the cup. I beg to pass, there is no good news. I was born as wood, a thrown match cutting open the five wounds on this ground. I am a minor prophet and sometimes I see the loins of God giving birth to her son. Surely there is prayer in my horn's throat, wine in redemption. I stand on limbo's chasm, play. Each note shouts gospel. Things ain't always gonna be this way. This is how to get over. Follow the hoot owl witness. And there might be consolation on this trail, grace at the tree's root. I'm bound for the other side of glory. My feet ain't meant to dangle. Lord, I know I've been changed. The only sound is mourning and I call you by the thousand names you have whispered to me in song. Speak your red clay promise that blood cries out and rises from ash that you will not rest on the seventh day. Sila, after Margaret Walker's For My People. The Lord clings to my hands after a night of shouting. The Lord stands on my roof and sleeps in my bed, sings the darkened Egun tunnel cooks my food in abundance. Though I was once foolish and wished for an empty stomach, the Lord drapes me with rolls of fat and plaits my hair with sanity, gives me air, music from unremembered fever, this air. Oh, that I may give air to my people 
Oh, interruption of murder, the welcome seal. The Lord is a green Tubman escape, a street buzzing with concern, minds discarding answers, black feet on a century's long journey. The Lord is the dead one scratching my face, pinching me in dreams, the screaming of the little girl that I was, the rocking of the little girl that I was, the sweet hush of her healing, her syllables skipping on homesick pink. I pray to a God of confused love, a toe touching blood and swimming through Moses water, a cloth and wise rocking and eventual pass over. Outline skeletons will sing this day of air for my people. Oh, the roar of God. Oh, I prophesy walking. Thank you. Sorry, this has been a week. This has been a week. I'm sorry. Brother Tyree, you moved me so deeply. You are really, if you could have seen me when I was listening to read and I was like, mm, 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 mm. So good, so good, such a blessing. Thank you, my brother. Oh, thank you, that was, I needed that. Uh, so uh, I do, I mean, I know we're supposed to talk now. I have a, I've been a fan of your work for a long, long time. Shut up, um, for real? I, um, I mean, I sat down and did, you know, my homework today and make sure I was ready for this, so. I got questions, but if you want to do your thing, I mean, it's up. It's no, whatever you I, want. Want, I want to ask you a question because your work, your work, your, first of all, let's say we are home people, right? We own biscuits. You from North Carolina. I'm, I'm from Durham, North Carolina, right? As I said in the, um, when we were in the green room, 26080 Sweep Street um in durham north carolina i was taught piano lessons by the great uh mrs barbara cook um my mother was a um was a an adjunct professor at north carolina uh central university uh, my father taught with uh, uh gerald barracks uh at um north carolina state university right um so it's just a wonderful thing to sit down with home folks, right? Um, I, and I wonder, um, even though he's not a poet, I'm curious because we just lost him. Um, as a North Carolinian, how how did did Randall Keenan's work have any um, influence on you? You know, um, uh, so much. Uh, and I'm. Uh, Hopefully that, you know, I hope that you can hear it. Uh, just the idea of playing. I could. Some That's why I asked the question. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, so, you know, place and people and their connection and how they they work on each other. Uh, and uh, especially thinking about small towns, how in small towns, even if you don't know someone, what may happen to you also can affect them and like how that can show up in the work. Um, yeah, so Randall's work is so important. Um, uh, I'm thinking about the new book uh, as well as the, the first book, but thinking about the, the newest book, I was actually, um, before he passed away, emailing him because there's a story in there. Uh, what's the way? There's a story in there about a lady who... Uh, is at the grocery store and one day this guy walks up to her 
and shakes her hand and helps her put her groceries in. And she says he like walks off and just kind of disappears. And she starts being able to perform all these miracles. One of, one of the great scenes is like uh, she joins this church and and they go to serve people turkey barbecue one day. And she only has one thing of turkey barbecue and one pack of rolls. But in the story, it describes it how it never runs out. She serves all these hundreds of people. And it's just such a great story that's about like small towns and like people and but yeah, definitely. Mm. Randall's work is uh, extremely important. And, and it uh, has. Oh, go on here. Uh, I'm gonna say it has. You know, though you know he wasn't a poet, it has that musical quality. That's in his um, and, and, and in this time, you know, I'm now I'm a radical feminist. Anybody that knows my work knows that. But I have wondered, as as a, as an African American man, how how has this particular moment been affecting your work? Is that an intrusive question? No, no. Um, I don't see, um, I, I guess I should say I was raised by very honest people who told me what the world and showed me what the world was very early, you know what I mean? Uh, so though 2020 is an extraordinary year for many reasons, I've been very aware of the country that I live in. Uh, and so, you know, I I know exactly where I am and know, right, uh, and, and know what some in this country may think of me. And I, I mean, uh, maybe 2020 is definitely affected the way I move in the world, but I think I've always been aware, you know? Yeah, as a deep southerner, you know, like I knew what was going to happen with Sister Brianna's case. I knew. Right, yeah. I was still upset. Mm -hmm. Really oh. upset. Um, but I already knew. You know, I mean, I'm from, I'm, I'm not from North Carolina. My, my natural line is, is, is Georgian, central Georgia. My mother's people are from Eden. Um, my mother taught Alice Walker. That's how small that, that little town is, right? And um, I'm a little, I'm a little old for, I guess when the goody mob came out, I was in my late twenties or my thirties, but I remember, you know, when they said, you know, what, what y'all really know about the, about the, the dirty South, that was the clean version. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and I, and I thought, well, you know, they don't call it the dirty for nothing, you mm -hmm. know, and they've been doing this for a real long time. I think, um, I think I'm concerned about young people because, um, you know, uh, uh, a young brother like you now, you were raised with old folks, right? Mm -hmm. The old people are breaking down for you. But, but um, you know, if you're talking about young folks who didn't spend a lot of time with old people, they may not be prepared for this, right? You know, my mother's, my mother's people, my mother used to tell me about her um, great grandma Mandy, Right. There were two Mandy's. One was, according to family lore, a Native American woman, a Cherokee woman. But, you know, we don't know. Um, but she would talk about the African-American great grandma Mandy. And um, who was born into slavery. And I actually found her on the 1870 census. And so it did give her a is having been born into slavery. And mama would talk about how great man, grandma and Mandy would sit them down and try to tell them about slavery. And mama said, you know, I was a little girl and I was wiggly and I didn't pay much attention. And I wished I had paid more attention. But she remembers one story and that's about great grandma Mandy's father being sold down the river, right? and sold away from the plantation. 
And that has stuck with me, right? And great grandma Mandy used to have a saying. I've used it a couple of times. Cause you know, we're from the South. So we, we know people who speak in proverbs, right? They have uh, instantaneous proverbs, right? And great grandma Mandy would say, anytime you saw the master stepping through the court of smiling, watch out because he was getting ready to sell one of your children. And I, I think about this, um, you know, when I, when I think about this moment, right? That I was prepared for this moment, but I hoped that, um, that there would never be this moment, right? I was like, okay, you know, well, here we are again. Um, so it's been a week. My spirit and my heart has been open, you know. Um, I, you know, so it's, it's been a week. So you said you had some questions. I don't want to. I don't want to harsh the the room, right? I don't want to, you know, get the room sad. I mean, so. Okay, I, I watched your uh, Library of Congress reading again today. Oh, that's a deep cut, Brother Tyree. <laughs> you really did your research. I didn't want to embarrass myself. <laughs> um, so, uh, but just from that, I do have some questions. And thinking about the Dr. Wave's introduction and talking about, you know, from each book, uh, and each book, you know, deals with history in certain ways. And I and I was thinking about each book, which I got your books. Yeah, I got a few help you here. Um, but, <laughs> but like kind of each book is like appealing history, right? And I but I thought just to hear and maybe hear you talk about how you see just your own craft from each book or like just the movement from each book. Until you know, until the age of Phyllis. Well, so the first book, you know, I was just trying to get in where I fit in. You know, I didn't have no kind of plan for it. I just, you know, I just wanted a book, and I was, but you know, my work has always been about the South and history and all of that. That first poem in the book. Tuscaloosa River song um, that came to me in a vision. And that was back when I was very, uh, very deeply afraid of, of claiming spirituality, right? I just didn't, I didn't, you know, because I'm, I'm a very playful person. I'm very irreverent. I'm raw. I have a potty mouth, not in public. I try not to have it in public, but I really like to cuss. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> and see, oh, you see, so sweet. Woo! And my favorite word is mother. Mm -hmm. Right, I love that word. So, um, but you know, so I remember I started having visions in 1996. It was a very um, difficult time because I was also recovering memories of childhood abuse. And so I was just a mess, you know, emotionally and stuff. And then my, and then my, you know, I was in my art at the same time. So I had this, um, um, dream and, and I'm a Cobb Canham, uh, fellow. I was in the first group in 1996. Um, um, you know, and it's, it's not really a big, big part of my life now, but back then it was, right? And I remember I had the vision right before I was supposed to be coming to the second year, which was a very difficult um, year, very emotionally difficult, a whole bunch of stuff, you know? Like I said, I was a mess and other people there were mess and we was just all mess together. We were in our early 30s. You know, everybody's a mess when they're in their early 30s. And I remember trying to write this poem that filtered the, the experience of having a vision. And there was a brother that I met at that time, Ernesto Mercer, who um, was at Cave Cana, um, 
and and uh, um, belongs to. I don't want to start lying about which African religion he belongs to, but he continues to belong to it, and he's a priest. And and I remember his telling me, you know, Honore, you need to get training, blah blah blah. And I was like, whatever. I'm not trying to, you know, be walking around you know, with plump linen garments and chunky beads around my neck, you know, because I didn't want people to think I was pretentious, but these things are really tugging at me, right? And I was in Afa Michael Weaver's um, workshop. Um, and I called him Mr. Weaver because I'm from the deep South. We, we just don't call elders by our first name. Now I don't know about these kids around these parts nowadays, but you know, and it's fine if I invite someone to call me by my first name, right? But I'm just, uh, or if an elder says, call me, whatever, right? But I called him Mr. Weaver. I still call him Mr. Weaver after all these years. And I remember I was in the workshop with him. Um, and you know, there were a bunch of boys in the workshop and they were doing their boy thing, their cisgender heterosexual boy thing. <laughs> and, Mr. and Mr. Weaver would just sort of shut it down, you know, because, you know, guys tend to sort of get in there. Right. And I remember his saying, do you want this to be? I think he said chronicle, but like a spiritual chronicle, this 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 vision point that I had, this vision that I had of um, Tuscaloosa or or do you just want this to be? And I and I came back from Kaveh Kenem and I and and there was a way that I just began to weave the sort of realistic moment that I wanted to put into the poem and weave the the vision that I had, right? Um, and it was it was really weird um, doing that. But I, but one thing that Mr. Weaver, Mr. Weaver has helped me with many other different, um, for example, um, the blues essay that I wrote uh, and that I published uh, through um, the Kenyan Review. Mr. Weaver and I had a discussion about the three movements, black music and all of that, right? I like to have, you know, gray head people in my life have been real important to my journey, right? Uh, even though, you know, when I was young, I thought, you know, th they didn't matter, right? And the older I got, I realized, you know, they were they were helping me, right? And I came back home and I wrote that poem and that's why that poem is at the beginning of the Gospel of Barbecue. Now that I have um, embraced my Afro-Indigenous heritage, I cannot prove that I'm Indigenous. And so what I do is I try to be very respectful and I don't claim membership in the community, but my role is to tend the altars of Native American ancestors. And that seems to be working out well, right? You know. Um, I've been uh, uh, published in a, a couple of Native American publications. I'm coming out in another one, but I'm very careful to, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't want to be Elizabeth Warren, right? I'm very, I'm very careful about how I do that. But I realized that even though I was not ready to tend those altars that ancestors had a different idea. And that's why he came to me. And so when you see all but I think one of my books, Outlandish Blues, I don't think has a an indigenous um, uh, component, but every one of my books, and this novel that's coming out, they all do, right? Because you can't be Southern and black without acknowledging how that culture, those cultures, have connected. So that's how the craft, that that's that's how I, but I weave, and then there are some times where, you know, the craft that I try, and I'm sure you're the same way, the craft you try to impose upon the poem is not is not the craft that need that the poem needs. Uh, I, I love that you said that you 
but uh, also just to let you know we're supposed to wrap it up. But this is yeah, we supposed to wrap this up. Uh, if y'all this want an after party on Twitter, you know. There we go. Uh, I just want to say I, I love that you talk about how you wrap what's happening in your real life into the craft, right? And um, how you kind of weave those together. Because I mean, that's how I like to think about my work because I, I think about through memory, right? These stories I've been told and then how I can weave that into the craft as well. Um, thank you so much for letting me read with you. Uh, it was an honor. It was my honor. It was my pleasure. Mm -hmm. And thank you to the Academy of American um, Poets uh, for allowing this blessing. I, I really needed this blessing with with Brother Tyree. And Brother Tyree, I hope this ain't the last time that we no. fellowship, right? As the old folks say. Thanks so much, Honoré and Tyree, and for sharing your work with us tonight. And um, to everyone who joined us, uh, thank you for coming to our very first Books Noted Live. We're so grateful for your support of the poets we featured this evening. Um, you may purchase copies of their books, uh, The Age of Phyllis, Poems by Honoré Fanon Jeffers from Wesleyan University Press and Cardinal by Tyree Day from Copper Canyon Press um, by clicking on the little button below. Our next Books Noted Live virtual reading and conversation will take place on Friday, October 9th and will feature the poets Aditi Machado and Pamela Sneed. To register for that event and to see our full lineup of events this fall through the winter, please visit poets.org. Um, so thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Please take care and good evening. Bye, all.